Would you take your Bibles this morning and turn in them to 1 Thessalonians and the first chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. As you turn there, back in the 80s there was a movie that was very popular. It was called The Dead Poets Society. I wonder how many of you saw that movie. In that movie, Robin Williams was the star and he was playing a character, a teacher at a private, elite, all-boys school in the eastern U.S. And he took his job very seriously as their teacher. It was his goal to inspire these students of his to make their lives nothing less than extraordinary. He called them to, to live bigger than simply the small things in life. In fact, he summarized his call to them with the words carpe diem, Latin for seize the day. And he said to his students as a reason to inspire them to seize today with all of their might, he said, we are food for worms, lads. Because believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room is going to stop breathing, grow old, and die. The great Russian novelist Tolstoy wrestled with the very same idea, death and what comes after, when he asked himself, what will become of my entire life? Is there any meaning? Any meaning in my life that will not be annihilated by the inevitability of death which awaits me. I wonder how many of you have thought of these very things. What comes after life? What am I living for? And is there any future beyond being eaten by worms in a grave? Is the writer to, the, to Ecclesiastes correct when he concludes, vanity of vanity, all is vanity? You know in your sober, reflective moments that Life is short, and it can be just as easily wasted as it can be lived to the full. And I know that there's not a person here in the sound of my voice today who wants to waste your life. So how can you be sure that you're investing it in something that will matter at the end? An investment that won't depreciate or be destroyed by death. Something that lives on after you're gone. Well, where do you turn for an investment that's big enough to pour your life into? Well, how about you listen to Jesus? Find out what he says. After all, even those who don't worship him respect him as the greatest mind who ever walked this earth. Jesus said... I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, Jesus is saying, my church will advance, it will be built, and there is no power, no passage of time that can keep me from accomplishing that purpose. I will build my church. Now, doesn't that sound like a worthy investment for your life? Notice what Jesus doesn't promise. He doesn't promise, I will build a hiking trail so that you get, get out into nature and feel close to me in the solitude of the outdoors. Nature is a blessing for sure. Being able to get out and enjoy it is truly a gift, but, but it's not enough. Jesus also didn't promise, I will build technological innovation so that you can watch a preacher on TV and grow to Christian maturity. Again, technology is a blessing and it's a gift to be able to expand the reach of God's word outside the doors of the church, an opportunity that technology gives to us, but that's not where ultimate blessing is to be found. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the church of Jesus Christ is at the very center of God's purpose in this world. So if you want your life to be lived in line with God's purposes, and if you want your life to count and to have a legacy that matters when you die, then I would encourage you this morning, friend, be a living, active part of a healthy local church. And I know the very fact that you are here this morning or listening to this message somehow from God's word 
It's an indication that you get it. At least you get it a little bit. To one degree or another, you understand the importance of the church. So what does it mean to be a part of a local church? What does it mean to be a living, active part of a healthy church? You know as well as I do that just because people gather together and organize themselves and hang a sign out front of their gathering calling themselves this church or that church doesn't automatically make it a healthy church. So how do we know what a church ought to look like and focus on and be characterized so that we can be a healthy part of it? Well, that's where the letters of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians come in. 1st Thessalonians, as I mentioned last week, is likely the very first New Testament letter written to any church. It was written to one of the first churches in Europe, our spiritual ancestors, as it were, and it was written to a church in a society that was very much like ours. So you think there might be something in here for us today. I firmly believe, friends, that there is rich soul-satisfying and mission-enhancing nourishment for us in these letters. And that's why we're embarking on this journey which will take us through the fall, through the letters of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. And this morning we want to focus on the first five verses of chapter 1 of 1st Thessalonians. I will read them. Please follow along in your text. 1st Thessalonians 1 and verse 1. Paul Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not in word alone, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. This is the word of the Lord, and may he add his blessing to the very reading of it. Now, we do read these words, and, and you appreciate them. I trust you appreciate them. But there are some here this morning, and I know you can't help yourself, but can't help but thinking that this is an ancient letter. It's written in the format of ancient letters. It's written to a very distant city at a very different time in vastly different circumstances. And you are thinking to yourself, I have challenges in my day today that Paul and the Thessalonian church knew nothing about. So what can this have to say to me right now? Well, I want to tell you this morning that the similarities between us and this church that Paul is writing to are great. Let me remind you briefly of how this church began. Remember, Paul comes into this bustling cosmopolitan city, this city that has a port up to its front door that also sits on the major east-west highway of the entire Roman Empire. It's a busy city. It's a prosperous city. It's a well-connected cosmopolitan city with people arriving on its shores and in its doors from many different nations. It's a religious city. It's populated with a variety of gods that are worshipped. There's even a temple there to a god from Egypt. This is a religious city, and it's a population center, one of the great cities of the entire Roman Empire. So Thessalonica would pride itself on being a cosmopolitan city, a tolerant city, very much like our city today, here in Abbotsford and Vancouver. But in this tolerant city, there is one thing that is not tolerated, and that is this. Anyone who tries to declare that there is only one God, one king, especially here in this patriotic Roman city where one of the deities worshipped is the Roman emperor himself, 
Well, into this city walks Paul and his team, and they are proclaiming Jesus as Messiah, the king above every king. Well, that could be taken as a threatening message to any loyal Roman. And sure enough, people come to faith in Jesus Christ, a church is formed, it's growing fast, a mob gets riled up by people who are jealous and angry of the popularity of this new message and its missionaries, and they storm the home where the church is meeting. They pound on the door of Jason, the homeowner and host of the church. They grab him by the neck and drag him to the city authorities. Well, the city authorities, the politarchs, as we talked last week about, they show a measure of restraint. They don't overreact. They don't punish Jason beyond forcing him to post bond. It's a promissory note that there will be no more trouble caused by him or these Christians as if they were responsible for any of the rampaging mobs damage to the peace of the city. But with the heat on from the troublemakers in town, The end is clear. Paul and Silas cannot stay in this city. Paul has no choice but to leave. He's been there a matter of weeks, maybe a few short months, but he's got to go. So that very night when night falls and under the cover of darkness, a handful of newly born again brothers lead Paul and Silas through quiet, dark streets, cloaks pulled tightly around their necks, heads down to avoid eye contact with anyone who could cause a potential conflict. And out through the streets they walked, out past the Arch of Augustus they walked, out of town they go, and onto the Ignatian Way, the main highway of the empire. The pair make their way off the Ignatian Way, down south to the town of Berea, just far enough to be out of trouble, but close enough to Thessalonica that as soon as word comes that the tension has dissipated in the city, they can go back and continue their ministry. Well, there they wait in Berea. And there they wait. News doesn't come. In fact, word somehow gets back to Thessalonica that Paul and Silas are just down the road and the mob comes from Thessalonica to Berea and they chase Paul and Silas out of this mission field too. So down to the port they go, they hop a ship to Athens, heading further away from Thessalonica, not closer to it. And all the while, they're waiting for a signal that the coast is clear and Paul can head back to his beloved spiritual babies in Thessalonica. Well, they get to Athens, there's still no word. Paul's fatherly heart is reaching the breaking point of worry over how these young Christians that I have just led to the Lord are faring, holding up back in the city in which I left them and fighting panic that the strain and persecution has been too much for them. Finally, Paul can take it no longer and he sends Timothy back. Sends him back to get a first-hand account of the situation in Thessalonica, how these fledgling believers are holding up or not, and to take encouragement with him. Paul explains his heart in chapter 3, verse 5 of 1 Thessalonians. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. In the meantime, Paul leaves Athens, makes the journey southwest to Corinth where he ministers the gospel. Finally, after who knows how long, Timothy makes it back, joins Paul in Corinth, and brings back the news from Thessalonica, and the news is is good. The church in Thessalonica is standing firm. And the Christians, why they still may be babies in time, but they are not simply holding on like babies. Their faith is growing. God is faithful. And that's what sparks this letter, friend. It comes from a place of joyful relief. It comes from thanksgiving and overflowing praise on the part of this apostle. In fact, verses 2 to 5 of chapter 1, our text for this morning, Those verses make up one single sentence in the original Greek, and that entire sentence is held together by one single verb. In verse 2, the verb is, we give thanks. 
We give thanks to God for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. See, the overflowing heart of this relieved father of the faithful in Thessalonica. Remember, this is the brilliant Paul. Remember who's writing this. This is a man who was immensely talented, brilliant, a great organizer, dedicated to a cause. He could have invested his life in a career that would have brought him financial security, public prestige, a life of comfort. He could have climbed the ladder of social success that he surely would have been able to get to the top of. But look at him here in Corinth. Even as he writes these words, his back is still scarred from the rods that ripped his flesh apart. On the move for his life, he goes from city to city and his whole life is bound up with the state of the lives of the Christians and the churches he loves and has had to leave behind. Here is one who has chosen what is worthy of investing his life in, and it is the church of Jesus Christ. And in our text this morning, Paul gives three reasons for his thanksgiving and his confidence that the Thessalonians would would be okay. First reason is the church's identity. The second reason is the church's distinguishing characteristics. And the third reason is the church's very foundation. We'll make our way through these points one by one. First, the the church's identity. See, despite the fact that this church is so young, despite the fact that this little fledgling church is surrounded by a hostile city, despite the fact that Paul had to leave it far too early for his liking, he is confident now after the report from Timothy about the security of its future. And why is that? Because of its identity. Verse 1, the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's church. That's the identity of the Thessalonian Christians. Now some of you, something you need to see before we go any further is the way that Paul so comfortably and naturally puts God the Father together with Jesus Christ In fact, he does it so smoothly and naturally in verse 1 that it's easy to miss just how massively important this is. Remember, this is 51 or 52 AD. It's just a matter of weeks after he's planted this church, and this is within 20 years of Jesus' life and death and resurrection and ascension. 20 years after Jesus walked this earth, and already, do you notice the apostle is joining together God the Father and Jesus Christ as one in in equality? Two different persons, one in equality. This is the faith of the universal church. Otherwise, Paul isn't talking like that without some great explanation. This is a faith that is devotedly monotheistic, believes in one God and one God only, and yet here it is. It's worshiping Jesus Christ as divine and fully equal with the Father. This is critical for us to understand. It's especially critical for us to understand in our day when there are Bible scholars as well as, unfortunately, people on the inside of the visible church today, and they will try to tell you that the deity of Jesus Christ, worshiping him as God, was a gradual process that people didn't actually start to follow until centuries later, centuries after his life. In fact, one famous scholar, John Hick, was part of the Tragic Jesus Seminar a number of years ago. He put it this way, Christology, like Buddhology, developed over a very large number of years. So he's likening the growth in importance of Jesus Christ until he was seen as a god to be worshipped, liking that to the long developed process of the Buddhist religion that came to see Buddha as divine. But the problem with that is it doesn't work. See, the followers of Buddha didn't start to ascribe divine honors to Buddha until 500 years after his life and death, 500 years. 
Here we are in 1 Thessalonians, inside of 20 years of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, and it's taken for granted in the church that he is worshipped as God. So here what Paul is saying is this church belongs to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul is confident about the Thessalonians' future. In fact, as I touched on last week, the church doesn't just belong to God. Its very existence is in God, as verse 1 puts it. The church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So hear what the Bible is saying to us, Christian. You are living in two different locations. You are living in Thessalonica, or Abbotsford, or Chilliwack, or Langley. Yes, you reside there right now. But your ultimate home is in the mighty arms of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. You see what that does to us as Christians? When you feel insecure about the future, when you feel as though the church in our society is losing its place and your Christian faith makes you an outsider in social circles, when you feel buffeted by the waves of opposition, don't ever forget, friend, that your strength doesn't come from the circumstances around you. Your security comes from the God in whom you live and the Jesus Christ who saved you and is right now sovereign over everything. Jesus Christ is sovereign over creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were created by Him and through Him. Without Him was nothing made that has been made. Jesus Christ is sovereign over the universe. There is no yet-to-be-discovered star in the unseen distances of space, not a single hair on your head that falls outside of the plan and purpose of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is sovereign over human governments, as Psalm 2 puts it. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, all of them in other words, set themselves up against the the Lord. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords away from us. Does that sound like today's society? Jesus Christ is sovereign. He who sits in the heavens laugh, Psalm 2 says. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. Jesus Christ is sovereign over creation, over the universe, over human governments, and over justice and judgment. He is sovereign, this Christ in whom we live as Christians. As Abraham Kuyper put it famously, there is not a square inch in the whole domain over of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And if you're a Christian, then you live in in God the Father and in Jesus Christ his Son, my friend. And Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will, you will be nourished and you will be watered and you will bear much fruit. The identity of the Christian in God and in his Son, Jesus Christ, is a reason for confidence, a reason to pour ourselves into his church. But the second reason Paul gives for giving thanks for the Christian church in Thessalonica with confidence comes through the distinguishing marks that this church displays, marks that set it apart from the surrounding culture and that demonstrate this group of people, this is an authentic body of believers. Now, the memory of his time in Thessalonica with the believers is still fresh in Paul's mind when Timothy comes back. And this report that Timothy brings on the state of the church, the words of that report are ringing still in the apostles' ears, moving him to thank God and praise him for his faithfulness to this fledgling church in a hostile culture. But there are three specific things 
that Paul must have been waiting to hear about in the report, and he's overjoyed because he's obviously heard them from Timothy, that the Thessalonians are manifesting these three qualities. Take a look at verses 2 and 3, because Paul specifically mentions these three qualities right there. Verse 2, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch those? Faith, love, and hope. I want you to think about something. You see if your Bible knowledge is where it should be. Do those three qualities listed together sound familiar to you at all? Well, if you know 1 Corinthians 13, they should. 1 Corinthians 13, or the love chapter, as many of us have come to know it, that chapter ends with these words. After talking about all these spiritual gifts that God has given to his people for the building up of the church and how they will all fade away, he ends that chapter by saying, but faith, hope, and love remain. But the greatest of these is love. There are other places in other parts of Paul's letters where he puts these three qualities together as well. These are critical, distinguishing features of an authentic Christian life. Faith, love, and hope. But this is the very first place where these three qualities appear in Paul's letters. So let's now just take a look at each feature one by one very briefly. First of all, the work of faith in verse 2. The question we need to ask ourselves is, How do I really know whether I actually trust in God or not? Well, because I have faith. But what's gospel faith? Gospel or saving faith, that's receiving the finished work of Jesus Christ and resting on him alone for my salvation. There is a faith that doesn't save, friends. Make sure that that is not the faith that characterizes you. Merely believing that Jesus is who he said he is, merely believing that he died on a cross and rose physically from a grave and ascended even to, into heaven, even believing that he will come back one day. You can say, sure, I believe in Jesus, but intellectual assent is is not the same as saving faith. By faith we receive what Christ has accomplished on the cross and in his resurrection. And if I truly believe, then my faith will bring the reality of that good news into my life, into my world, because my life will reflect it. True faith always works. You need to hear this because sometimes people try to pit Paul against James, two apostles, and people try to pit the two of them together, against each other, I should say. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, for example, by grace you are saved through faith. It's not a result of works. But James in his letter says, faith without works is dead. And people say, ha, see the difference? They can't both be right. One says there is no works that brings you saving faith, saving salvation. The other says if you don't have works, your faith is dead. See the contradiction there? But in our passage here, see what Paul is saying. He's saying the very same thing that James does in his book. He's just putting it in a different way, a positive tone. He's saying, I can see your faith is real. Why? Because I can see it working. He says that your, life, your faith is real because it's alive and it's working. Take a look at verses 8 to 10 of chapter 1. Your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. So that we need not say anything, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So true faith always produces fruit. Are you producing fruit in your Christian life? Can somebody from the outside look at where you are in your Christian faith today and see that there is fruit manifesting out of your life that wasn't there a year ago or two years ago or 10 years ago? 
True faith works. The second quality that Paul points out in our verses is the labor of love. Look back at verse 2 or verse 3. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love. Work of faith and labor of love. Hang on a second. At first glance, does it look like maybe Paul is just repeating himself here? Work and labor. What's the difference? Is that the same thing? Well, there is a difference. The word translated labor in our English Bibles here, the second quality, that word is the Greek word kapos, which it signifies an, an intense labor. It, it signifies a hard work. It's the difference between going on a leisurely stroll on a nice summer day and giving your everything in an endurance race until you drop at the end. Paul says, I hear about your faith. I hear that you are loving each other like that. You are loving each other until it hurts. And it drives me to thanksgiving because it shows that your faith is real. And isn't it true? Isn't it true that sometimes it is toil to love your brothers and sisters in the church family? I mean, look at each other. Look at you. We have some strange people here. Not to mention the one that's standing behind the pulpit right now. This is not a club where we are joined together by our mutual interests or our ages or our backgrounds. We are so, so different in so many ways. And that makes loving each other a challenge sometimes. Especially when we let each other down. Especially when that other person in your circle of relationships within the church frustrates you. They let you down, they they have those quirks that drive you crazy, and they have those shortcomings that make you frustrated. And yet I continue to be stunned by the and overwhelmed by the thanksgiving that comes up within my heart in the way that so many of you here in this church family, in this Maranatha family, are loving each other. There's so many The rest don't know about this in many cases. So many of you are behind the scenes, not on display, not broadcasting what you're doing, but behind the scenes, you're quietly going about your business, caring for each other, phoning each other, visiting each other, taking meals, doing laundry, doing shopping. You're pouring yourself in to the body here. Keep it up, friends. You are toiling in love, and that is a mark of authentic Christianity. So Paul is thankful for the Thessalonian church and how it's marked by a faith that bears fruit in action. He's thankful for the love, the working love that he hears about, a love that pours itself into the brothers and sisters in the family of God. And the third distinguishing mark of the church that moves Paul to thanksgiving and praise comes at the end of verse 3. Your work of faith and labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Steadfastness of hope. That is a clinging determinedly to hope. And oh, how the Thessalonians needed that. Life was hard for these Thessalonian Christians. The persecution was rising in the city around them. By the the time Paul writes this letter, it's understood that there are several people within the Christian congregation that are no longer alive. They've already died. Some may be due to the consequences of the persecution they're enduring. We're not sure. But there is no light on the end of the horizon, humanly speaking. Society in Thessalonica wasn't getting better around the Christians. The the Roman Empire was not interested in the gospel message. So how do these Christians hold on? How do they keep on joyfully serving the Savior? How do they keep on loving each other when it's hard? Because their faith is real. 
And the steadfastness, the firm, unyielding grip of their hope demonstrates it. They believed that in spite of what they could see around them, Jesus is reigning. He is reigning right now, and he is coming back to put all things right. That was their hope. And I wonder, is it our hope? This year at the annual Ligonier Conference in Orlando, Stephen Nichols, who is on staff at Ligonier Ministries, he's also heads up Reformation Bible College, he spoke and he told the story of Polycarp. Some of you have heard of the story of Polycarp. He was the aged bishop of Smyrna, which is in modern day Turkey. Well, Polycarp was born about 20 years after Paul writes this letter. He spends his entire life in ministry, leading, serving in the church. When he's 86 years old, he's retired from public ministry, but he's still serving the Lord and he is declared to be an enemy of the state, an enemy of Rome. The authorities track him down. He's in a farmhouse upstairs in a room. They bring him to the chief of police. Interestingly, he asks before they arrest him, uh, he's not going to put up a fight, but could he have some time to pray? And they let him pray, and he prayed for two hours, including praying for those soldiers who had come to take him off for judgment. They take him off to the proconsul. They say, here's the verdict. Turn to your fellow Christians and say, away with the atheists, and you'll be released. One of the great ironies of the early church is that the Christians were called atheists because they denied the gods of the state. They clung to one god, and so they were considered atheists. Well, the proconsul tried to reason with Polycarp, said, you're an old man now. Think of your age. Just distance yourself from these fellow atheists of yours, and you'll be free. You can die in peace. What did Polycarp say? He said, 86 years I have served him, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme now my king who saved me? They tried a little bit more to, to get him off the hook. They felt bad about what they were doing. One more time, just distance yourself from your Christian fellows and say, away with the atheists. Do you know what Polycarp did? Well, they took him to the stadium, packed with, with fans looking for an event, looking for judgment to happen, packed with an unruly mob of Roman citizens. And Polycarp stands on the floor of that stadium, looks out at the crowd of Romans surrounded by, or surrounding him. He points to them and he cries out, away with the atheists. And he was burned at the stake and stabbed with a dagger. Now, what would cause an old man to ensure his own violent death by standing so stubbornly when all he had to do was say a few words and he could die in peace? It was his steadfastness of hope. That's what it was. In our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who he knew was coming in power to reign visibly forever and ever. In Polycarp's day, there was a, a... a book written, a treatise written in, right after his death, within the, the year. It was called The Martyrdom of Polycarp. And the author of that, that leaflet puts it this way. All of this was happening while Philip of Trellis was high priest, false religion, while Stadius Quadratus was proconsul, a fiendish, tyrannical, oppressive government, but when Jesus Christ was reigning as king forever and ever, and Polycarp knew it, and it was his steadfastness of hope that let him stand firm to the end. Well, that was in the second century A.D. Now fast forward to the 20th century and post-World War China. After the war in China, after the communists took over, there was a government crackdown and they cracked down on all things Christian. It was an intense time of persecution. Churches were leveled to the ground. Christians are imprisoned. They are persecuted. Families are suffering. And the Bibles are all confiscated. So 
So what do the Christians do in a hostile territory like that? Do they, do they give in to the tyranny? Do they give up their faith to preserve their lives? You've got to give up what you believe in to get along smoothly and comfortably in life? Well, they just accept that there would be no more feeding on the Word of God, so they just got to make it through on their own strength? No, this is what they did. This is what the Christians in China did. They remembered that the previous generation of missionaries that came to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, they all were buried with their Bibles when they died. So the Christians went to the graves of these missionaries They exhumed the bodies of these dead servants of Christ, not to be disrespectful at all, but to recover the Bibles from their caskets. And then what they would do is they would take one precious Bible for a Christian community, and they would hand that Bible off one person to another, and everyone would get a turn with this Bible. And when it was your turn, what you would do is you would take that Bible, and you would handwrite copies of the biblical books, as many as you could in the time that you had, and then you would hand off that Bible to someone else, and they would handwrite copies of the biblical books. Well, at the Ligonier Conference this year, Stephen Nichols held up a copy in Chinese of one of these Bibles. Priceless. He read from the book of Revelation, hand copied, taken from the Bible of an exhumed dead missionary, the priceless piece of literature. But in the face of a hostile world, with all of its political clout and all of its military might arrayed around you and the handful of seemingly powerless believers, what can motivate you to go to such lengths to read and copy and pass around a forbidden book? A steadfastness of hope. Revelation that was read at the conference. Revelation 1, 5 to 8. Can you picture a Chinese believer huddled in secret, writing desperately and furiously as fast as possible to get as much down before it came time to pass the Bible on to someone else, writing these words. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. When you have steadfast faith that that same Jesus is coming, then it doesn't matter if your entire country is around you ready with the sword or the gun to put you in the grave. You will stand firm because you know who is in control. Faith, love, and hope. Those are sure characteristics that I've been born again. And I know that there's some here this morning and you're very discouraged. The future doesn't look particularly bright for you. You have insecurities about yourself. You have insecurities about your health. You have insecurities about the future of our nation and our society. And you just play and feel down in the dumps. Let me ask you, how are you doing in the faith, love, and hope departments? Because if you feel like you've slid off the road of Christian joy and you've slid into the ditch of despair, a great way to regain your bearings and get back out of the ditch and onto the road is to reorient yourself in your faith and love and hope because of who you are in Jesus Christ. 
Remember when you came to faith in Christ? Remember what God did in your life originally there, how he lifted you up out of your old introversion and that prison cell of self-preoccupation that we are all born with and tempted by constantly. Remember how God grabbed hold of you. You put your trust in Jesus Christ, and he redirected your attention up to the majesty and glory of God, the the wonder and supremacy of Jesus Christ. And, And then you started to notice the people around you that God had put people into your life and you couldn't help but show love to them and serve them out of the overflow of your joy in your new life in Jesus Christ. You had a heartfelt care for them that you could never have manufactured in yourself before. And your mood, all of a sudden your mood didn't depend on your circumstances because you were in God's unfailing grip and Jesus Christ the King was coming back again. So you floated on clouds of bliss when everything was going your way. And when times were tough, you no longer crashed on the rocks of your circumstances because circumstances couldn't control you any longer. That's authentic faith. Cling to it, Christian. Cling to it. So Paul is thankful for the church because of its identity, living in God and in his unfailing grip. He's thankful for the church because it manifests the distinguishing features of faith, love, and hope. And thirdly, Paul is able to give thanks for the church because he knows the foundation of the new community. Let's pick up our text at verse 4. Verse 4. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. He loved you and he's chosen you. This is the ultimate ground of all of Paul's thankfulness that God loved you. He set his love upon you in eternity past, as Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 puts it, and he chose you to be his people in that love. And I know I've come to this verse, and here we are dealing with the doctrine of election again. And it's such a controversial doctrine. On the one side, you have the theological tradition known as Arminianism. And it argues that election is based on God looking ahead through the portals of time and seeing the future. And he can see ahead of time who will choose him if given the opportunity. So he elected them to be his children. On the other side, you have the theological tradition known as the Calvinism. That school of thought that argues that election is God's free choice that he doesn't choose us because of some foreseen faith that comes from us. His choice isn't limited by my will, but I follow Jesus because he chose us and gave us the will to trust him. This is a doctrine that has been debated for centuries. It will continue to be debated until Jesus returns. There's mystery here. And I know that we just touched on this subject just a couple of weeks ago, and I remember talking to somebody after that service last time, and, and they don't necessarily interpret the Scripture exactly as I do, and they said at the end of the sermon, I made it through, I made it through. He said, my knuckles are white from holding on to the handrails, but, but I made it through. I don't want to torment anybody anymore. And let me assure you, I'm not looking to ride a hobby horse here, but as we make our way through the books of the Bible, we can't avoid subjects when they show up. And here we have it, right here in verse 4 of our text, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Here's one of the problems when the subject comes up, that too often people are content to debate this subject as though it was an academic discussion and nothing more. Something along the lines of, could God create a rock so big that even he couldn't lift it? One of those kind of academic curiosities and nothing more. We are easily contented, far too easily contented to try to peer behind the curtain into the unseen eternal plan of God to satisfy our curiosity alone. But you see, Paul isn't doing that here. 
Paul is bringing the doctrine of election right down to the streets of Thessalonica and Abbotsford. And he's explaining to these young Christians who are suffering persecution in their city that he knows they are God's elect, not because he can see into the mind of God and understand every intricacy of his sovereign plan, but because in Thessalonica, as he says in verse 5, the gospel came to them in power and they believed. See, this is no dry academic debate. Paul is using the doctrine of election here to bring assurance to needy Christians. And by calling these Christians elect, well, many of them were God-fears. They've lived for months, for years in learning about the Old Testament, learning in the synagogue hearing about the election of Israel. And by calling these Christians elect, Paul is using language from the Old Testament, language used exclusively for the nation of Israel. So these God-fearers who have been hearing the lessons from the Old Testament scriptures, they know of God's election of Israel. He chose that nation to be his people. And now he's applying that very same language to this largely Gentile church in this pagan-dominated city of Thessalonica. In fact, in fact, he doesn't just apply election to the church in general. He applies it to every Christian, each individual who makes up the church. Do you see that in verse 4? For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Each one of you. He's chosen you. But why? Why would he choose them? Why would he choose us? Well, according to Moses in Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8, we know why he didn't choose us. As Moses said there in Deuteronomy 7, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it's because the Lord loves you. You see that? God loves you because he loves you. He loves you because that's who he is. He loves you. Oh, Christian, God does not love you because you're smarter than anyone else. He doesn't love you because you're more morally upright than anyone else. He doesn't love you because you've got a certain status in the community. He doesn't love you for anything that he needs from you that you can bring to the table to help him out in his sovereign rule of the universe. God loves you because he loves you. And that should drive us to our knees in humble adoration and then out into this world to declare the glory of a God who loves sinners like this. Charles Wesley, one of my favorite hymn writers, wrote so many wonderful, powerful hymns. But in my mind, he wrote no more powerful hymn than And Can It Be. What a powerful, beautiful picture of salvation he paints by the words he composed. We love to sing it here. We haven't sung it for a while. Maybe we could do that soon. One of the verses, this is how he puts it. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. And finally I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And that's my testimony right there, friend. That's my testimony. Is it yours? I come to him with nothing but my own sin and disinterest, running hard after the things of this world, trying to seize the day as Robin Williams counseled his young kids because there's nothing after this but worms eating your body in the grave. The Bible says, oh, there's so much more. There is a God who loves. There's a sovereign God who rules. 
And he chooses and he calls and he sets you free to follow him with faith and hope and love despite what's going on in the world around you. So back to the beginning of our message. Where can you invest your life that will leave a legacy after you're gone? Well, you can be a living, active part of a local church of Jesus Christ. And how can I really know that I belong to the church? Well, make sure you know your identity. Where you live? In God. Make sure your life is marked by the distinguishing characteristics of a Christian and Christ's church. Works of faith. Labor of love. And steadfastness of hope. And then cling to your foundation, friend. Cling to your foundation that you are in Christ because God loves you. And he loves you because he loves you. And so he has set you free. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word that comforts us when we need it, that challenges us when we need that, and that guides us through the maze of life in this world with all of its detours and deadly distractions. Lord, we thank you for the church at Thessalonica. We thank you for our brothers and sisters there who served you in the midst of opposition and in some ways without a mentor at their side to walk with them as they grew. But Lord, you loved them and you proved that their faith was was honest, was true because of the way they lived. Lord, we want to live that way. I pray for us, Lord, if there is anyone here this morning that doesn't know you personally, that has given intellectual assent to Jesus Christ but has never surrendered in saving faith, oh, we pray that you would penetrate through as only you can do and bring them to their knees in repentance of sin and grasping the cross and all that it means for us. And Lord, for those of us who do know you, set us free to walk with you in holy joy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.